Greetings to all Latin America and the world. I'm Luis Guillermo Garcia Bencomo, and this is a special Telesur program. I'm accompanied by Madeline Garcia, our correspondent in Venezuela, because the topic has to do precisely with this. She and six other journalists will be joining us today to address a very sensitive issue. It is about the, the territorial dispute between Venezuela and Guyana over the territory of the Guyana and Sequiba, considered by the Venezuelan state as the most important, longer lasting, and most difficult to resolve territorial policy issue the entire diplomatic history of Venezuela's republic, Marlene. Well, that's right. For Venezuelans, it is a matter of honor. It is a sensitive matter. It is a matter of patriotism. And all of those who were born 124 years ago, not that I'm old, but for five, five generations now, we have heard about the territory of the Guayana Esequiba. It is even drawn on the map as an area under claim. Venezuela denounces it as a dispossession by the United Kingdom that was consummated by Luis Guillermo in 1899, when the well-known Paris Arbitral Award was signed under the seat, the, the threat of the use of force and the manipulation of borderlines to dispossess Venezuela with the stroke of a pen of the Guayana Esequiba, which represents, imagine, one-seventh of its territory. That is to say, it is a big, as big as the country of Kuwait, which measures approximately 159,000 kilometers. That is to say, that area, which is Venezuela's, or which Venezuela claims it as its own, measures this and also has great natural resources. And that's the genesis of the situation, because the heart of the matter, as we say here, is geopolitics and economics. Well, and to talk just about that, a subject of such density, of such transcendence, we have a special guest but we leave it to this image to show it. Delcy Rodriguez, Delcy Rodriguez, Executive Vice President of Venezuela, lawyer, PhD thesis candidate in social law, Minister of People's Power for Foreign Affairs, President of the National Constituent Assembly of Venezuela, Executive Vice President of Venezuela since 2018 to date, and President of the Special Commission in Defense of the Esequibo. Well, Luis Guillermo, after knowing who our special guest is, the Vice President of the Republic, Delcy Rodriguez, we have to put in context what you are watching us on Telesur broadcasting screen and also on our platform. So let's see the following report. Los mapas venezolanos delimitan Venezuela maps delimit the geographical area of the Esequibo between the Esequibo River and the line of the 1899 Arbitral Award declared north and void by Venezuela. The name Guayana means land of word because it is a territory of 159,542 square kilometers that is part of the Taiko de Orinoco system to the Guainia or Guaini River and even to the Moruga River, which although it flows into the Atlantic, it is intercommunicated by the Morajuana Channel with the Guainia and Barima Rivers. This characteristic gives peculiar fertility to the Guayana Esequiba in its jungle formation with mountains, minor the resources, biodiversity, and fauna with more than 25 endemic species. The Quillatero waterfalls are one of the most important natural attractions, with a waterfall of 227 meters high. In 2015, the government of Guyana arbitrarily authorized ExxonMobil to explore in undermarketed waters after announcing the discovery of an oil field in the waters of the Caribbean coast. Well, welcome, Vice President. Welcome. Thank you. Well, precisely the first question has to be for everyone who is wondering what is the truth of the situation of the territory of Esequibo, Guyana. Well, we Venezuelans say, say that it is Venezuela. What is the truth of this? Look, the truth is that Venezuela was stripped of an important extension of its territory. When you analyze, well, and yesterday President Nicolás Maduro gave an extraordinary lecture on the period of formation of the territory from the colony to independence. Well, we were born with this territory. Even in the formation as general captaincy, the territory was part of Venezuela. It is Venezuela. And in our independence, we consolidated that territory. Then, as you will know, a territory very rich in minerals, mainly gold, 
Immediately afterwards, the British Crown is informed of the in immense natural resources in gold by explorers. Let's remember the Prussian Schumel, who is one of the ones who begins to manipulate the maps in some way. He did those lines. He did those lines, and also English traders who were in the region illegally exploding gold. The British Crown set itself the objective of appropriating the territory, a territory that never belonged to them, never. Because even when the Treaty of Tordesillas was signed between Portugal and Spain, Spain kept that territory. In the line that is fixed in the treaty, the territory remains. So when you realize how the process of misappropriation of the territory took place, it is very clear, it is very evident that the territory was stolen from Venezuela. And then, well, I am going to try to synthesize decades, decades, centuries of history. Then it is handed over to Guyana at, this, at the moment of its independence. Guyana inherited that territory, but it inherited in an illicit way. It is inherited something that has, had been stolen. They never, neither the United Kingdom nor Guyana, have had ever had the title of the territory. They never had it, never. Something that Venezuela has been able to demonstrate, its titles, its rights, well, everything that was the possession of the territory. And what does Guyana argue? No, Guyana intends to validate the fraud that was consummated in the Paris Arbitral Award of 1899. It intends to validate it as a title. But it is unheard of that a fraud can generate rights. That is unheard of in the legal world, in the world of international law. A fraud cannot generate rights. So Guyana's pretensions are really barbaric. They are rude, they are inexplicable. And the most recent one is the violation that they are doing in the sea. It is the most recent scandal that, we have ever, that they have ever made. We have spoken with leaders authorities from the whole Caribbean, they are arranging, giving concessions of a sea that is pending to be delimited because that sea has not yet been delimited between Venezuela and Guyana, which is what would correspond once the land dispute is solved. I am referring to the terrestrial, terrestrial territory, and that is what the 1966 Geneva Agreement is for. If there was so much certainty about the award, the 1966 Geneva Agreement would not exist. This is in the year 62, when the foreign minister at the time, Falcon Briceño, said in the fourth commission of the United Nations that a fraud was committed against Venezuela, a fraud in an arbitral sentence where Venezuela did not participate. You know that in the arbitral tribunal was formed by two Englishmen, two US citizens, and a representative of the Tsarist Russia. Venezuela never participated in the sentence. It did not either participate in the Washington Treaty of 1897, which was the real political agreement. As the president explained very well, it was a political agreement between the United States and the Kingdom of Great Britain to take the territory away from Venezuela. If you will, it was the first Monroeist con consensus. Next, December 2nd, one day before our consultative referendum, the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine. Well, dispossessing Venezuela, stealing Venezuela's territory was the first Monroeist consensus with the British Crown. And why didn't Venezuela participate there? Venezuela remembers that it was living an internal situation of great weakness as the result of internal struggles. Venezuela was really going through a process of vulnerability and asked for the support from the international community. But that is where the empires found the best moment to seize the territory. One century later, in 2015, the Obama decree institutionalizes one of the most aggressive periods against our republic that our republican history can has known the illegitimate illegal blockade against venezuela to recreate situations of internal weakness because that same year is when the exxon mobil announced a world famous oil discovery in the disputed territory 
I was going to ask you about that. I wanted to know if after finding this, this made Guyana change its attitude against Venezuela completely. In 2014, we were leaving a process of good offices and the good officiant dies. Venezuela addressed the Secretary General of the United Nations in 2015 with express letters both from President Nicolás Maduro and at the time from the Foreign Ministry, asking him to resume the good offices. And Guyana at that time said no. No more good offices, curiously coinciding with the Exxon Mobil discovery. And here comes this whole process that Venezuela has led with much wisdom, with much patience, insisting that the Geneva Agreement is the only instrument that will allow for a practical solution, as the nature of the agreement states, practical and satisfactory for both parties. Practical and satisfactory for both parties, not for one party. That is why the nature and the legal object of the Geneva, Geneva Agreement is contradictory with a sentence of the International Court of Justice, because the International Court of Justice will not give a practical and satisfactory solution for both parties. We're going to address this issue later on because we have several questions. And as we said at the beginning, there are other journalists in the world who, as we are talking about a while ago, some of them do not know very well what is happening. And that is why it is so significant that we see the other journalists think on behalf of their people about the reality of Venezuela and the of Guyana. We have, for example, Victor Hugo Morales. You know, the Uruguayan journalist who lives in Argentina, a great soccer expert and a friend of ours who is a journalist who will ask you a question from there. The fact that there is a history of Great Britain behind Guyana determines that this involvement still exists. And therefore, the one being discussed is not only the one who represents Guyana's political interest, but other interests are represented at the same time. Hello, Victor Hugo. Well, in fact, we have always reviewed it, haven't we? Great Britain, the United Kingdom, an empire at that time, was the great despoiler and plunderer of territory all over the planet. They know that well because of the Malvinas Islands. The case of Malvinas, the Palestine case, which is very similar, how 18 years after the fraudulent award of 1899, in the case of Venezuela, the ball for declaration was issued where Great Britain handed over the territory of Palestine to Israel. And you can see how the territorial dispossession of Palestine has been progressing very similar to the processes that took place in the Essequibo territory in the Malvinas case and other territories in the world where the United Kingdom dispossesses territory and gave it to those who did not belong. It is a doctrine, a doctrine that continues to be in contention today because you realize the interest of the United States in this territory that is in controversy and in the sea that is pending the limitation, you realize the interests there are those of the United States. And you know that in the Washington Treaty of 1897, which was the great political consensus to dispossess Venezuela and which was consummated in the fraudulent award of 1899, implies that this territory is given to the United States by the Crown. They say, we give it to you, as happens with the energy interests that are present primarily in the territory in controversy, as well as in the sea to be delimited. They are US interests and are primarily Western interests. So we are really in the presence of a global war for energy resources. There are people who consider that the International Court of Justice is the highest. That is, before heaven, there is an international court. For some, however, Venezuela considers that the International Court of Justice has no competence. Let's say it has no jurisdictions in this field. Even the government has said so. So one wonders why Venezuela keeps going to the International Court. Since the foundation of the International Court of Justice, the position of Venezuela has been very clear as to not recognize the compulsory jurisdiction of the court. 
Only 70 countries in the world recognize the compulsory jurisdiction, that is to say they recognize the automatic jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice to settle matters of international interest. In this case, Venezuela has never recognized the compulsory jurisdiction and it has not recognized it precisely because we had the precedent of the fraudulent award of 1899 and this controversy. The only way that Venezuela could attend the court is when it manifests its will to attend the court. The Geneva Agreement is also very important because the Geneva Agreement assumes that both parties must agree on the means of settlement of the dispute. Both parties must agree on it. So much so that every time a good efficient was to be appointed, both Guyana and Venezuela had to express its willingness to agree. And the last event, which was under the current Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, is that the personal representative that he appoints before raising the matter to the International Court in violation of the Geneva Agreement was appointed with the consent and the manifestation of will of both parties. Venezuela cannot be obliged to a means of solution that it has not given its manifestation of will. So this is an issue that is a historical position in not recognizing the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. And that is why it is part of one of the questions of the referendum. Vice President, you've just mentioned that there are interests behind it. There is ExxonMobil now, and it would seem that Guyana is continuing the history of this possession of the territorial that the United Kingdom started. In Georgetown, we recently saw a photo of President Irfan Ali in the area that Venezuela claims as its own, and it is very close to the limit or the de facto line because it cannot be called a borderline because it is a territory that is not established as such. And we saw him dressed as a military man. Meanwhile, here in Venezuela, we saw the Minister of Defense dressed as a military man because he is in the Minister of Defense, but with a leaflet of the consultative referendum in his hand, the complete map. What is the reading between one and the other? You have said that Guyana has been ex escalating its aggression. They have tried to generate a mat matrix that Venezuela or a narrative that Venezuela is the big, powerful country with great resources that is attacking Guyana. You know very well that it is very clear to the world who is the victim here in the sense that Venezuela has been a victim, hasn't it, of the government of the United States directly in 2015 as well Obama's decree. First of the British Empire. Exactly, but in 2015 there is a decree that lays the foundational for the criminal and legi legi legitimate blockade against Venezuela. And you start to see the process and you also see a process of Guyana where their leaders begin to have been very aggressive attitudes towards Venezuela. We cannot forget that grand grandeur in 2015, one of the most anti-Venezuelan presidents Guyana has ever had, even declare that Simón Bolívar is the thorn in Guyana's throat. Simón Bolívar is the thorn in Guyana's throat. And there, these authorities become principles of ExxonMobil. When they decide to go to court, it is because the ExxonMobil orders them to go to court. Let us not forget that the ExxonMobil has paid the lawyers for the defense of Guyana in the International Court of Justice. When we were there precisely because there was a hearing, well, they arrived there in ExxonMobil airplanes paid by ExxonMobil. There is an instrumentalization of Guyana by ExxonMobil and its authorities are working as ExxonMobil employees. This decision of both the president of Guyana and its parliament not to go to negotiations, not to engage in dialogue, is part of a provocation script against Venezuela, what we have called the drums of war. And our minister of defense, as you have rightly said, has come out in promoting the consultative referendum to the Venezuelan people. That is a constitutional right of our constitutional order where Venezuelans have the right to be consulted on essential matters of national life. Just about that. And I come back again to the International Court of Justice, not because I'm personally very interested in it, but as the act, one has put one's cards on the table as well. 
Well, recently, Guyana went again to the International Court of Justice as it is trying to pigeonhole us there, asking that this instance to disregard the consecutive referendum of December 3rd. And at the same time, Luis Almagro, the ineffable, or some call him, Secretary General of, of Organization of American State, aligned himself with the Guyana position. He criticized the referendum and asked Venezuela to respect Guyana's decision to the court. This request for provis provisional measures to stop the consultative referendum in Venezuela is one of the most tremendous cries of desperation we have seen from Guyana. Really desperate, because there is no basis for the International Court of Justice to interfere in the internal affairs of Venezuela, of the internal order of Venezuela, the constitutional order of Venezuela. They were really showing a lot of desperation by pretending that the court can stop a consultative referendum, where the Venezuelan parliament, the Venezuelan National Assembly decided, unanimously approved, to call and consult our people. And well, then they went to the electoral power and set a date for December 3rd for our people to be consulted. How can an international court of justice come to stop a consultative referendum in Venezuela? This really has no legal or ju juridical basis whatsoever. It is only demonstrating not only Guyana's desperation, but also that Guyana has become a true colonialist conclave an imperialist conclave of those who are its allies. Who are Guyana's allies? Because they claim to be a victim, but who are Guyana's allies? With whom does Guyana carry out joint military exercises in this region threatening Venezuela? Nothing more and less than the United States Southern Command, who supports Venice, Guyana. Where did they go to ask for the consultative referendum to be stopped to the Organization of American States, of which Venezuela does not belong because it has a terrible record of coup d'etats, assassinations, invasions in Latin America and the Caribbean. Those are Guyana's friends, the great powers of Guyana's friends, and they threaten Venezuela because every time they carry out a joint military exercise with the Southern Command and the Pentagon, what they, are, they want to say is Venezuela. In other words, they're doing an open threat against Venezuela. Their partnership, I have said, their partnership is to attack Venezuela between the United States and Guyana. Vice President, if we look at the timeline of the year 2015 when Barack Obama signs the decree indicating Venezuela as an unusual threat to the security of the United States, months later, the thing, this thing happens, the famous ExxonMobil announcement, and then the whole aggression escalates. Do you think that this could be linked? Sure, it's concatenated, Madeleine. It is the fifth period that the president has called the conspiracy against Venezuela. They try to recreate a situation of internal weakness with the criminal blockade against our country, the economic blockade. And the Venezuelan people gave convincing signs in the Union Nacional. We have been victoriously overcoming the worst difficulties of our republic has ever known. They wanted to recreate the same conditions of 1899. And then, as I have said, they try to validate as a title of possession of that territory because they have a precarious possession of that territory. They tried to validate a title by giving it to a fraud. That is absolutely null and void. It does not exist. Fraud cannot have any legal effect on any situation, much less on this. And that is also why in the 1966 Geneva Agreement exists, because it was assumed that there was a claim on that. If it had not been assumed that there was a claim, there was a problem with that fraud. That award had to be a product of the political convenience between United States and the United Kingdom. The Geneva Agreement would not exist, but they intend to kill, to assassinate. But the Geneva Agreement says that it is enforced until it is a practical and satisfactory solution for both parties on that territorial dispute. Yes, by the way, Guyana says that this dialogue from Venezuela was already very annoying, and therefore he has not going to good, good efficient. But from Argentina, we are going now to Cuba from another journalist colleague from Radio Rebelde from Cuba, Ana Teresa Varia. Let's listen to her. Saludos, soy Ana Teresa Badia Greetings. Radio this is Ana Teresa Badia from Radio Rebelde in Havana. 
The first thing I wanted to ask you is what is related to the reasons of legislative constitutionality that Venezuela has for this referendum on December 3rd in the midst of accusations of alleged illegitimacy. Also, when analyzing Venezuelan politics, in recent times we noticed that both the government and some sectors of the opposition have condemned during the last hours the position of the organization of American states in relation to the issue. How do you interpret this position and this action? Thank you very much, Ana Teresa. You know very well that this is a national issue, not an issue of the Bolivarian government of Venezuela. The nation state. The state of the nation. We're also in the Barbados Agreement. It is stated that all political factors or opposition government assume this issue as a single issue of national unity, which is the defense of the territory of the Guayana Esequiba. And that there is a national consensus and the whole country, and therefore the importance and relevance of the referendum this December 3rd, the whole country is focused on this situation. Even people from the opposition who have spoken in favor. It is a cause, a common cause. It is a common cause, of course, and the opposition, we saw the statements of Gerardo Blythe, for example, about the declarations of the ill-fated Almagro, really a shame because Luis Almagro, he never stops making a fool of himself. Let's say that he never misses an opportunity to show ignorance because he completely ignores the history of our Latin America and the Caribbean. He does not know it, and every time he speaks, he shows it. But he does not only not miss an opportunity to show his ignorance, but he also does not miss an opportunity to tell his masters to the government of the United States in Washington, look, here I am, I'm a good employee, as I'm told once again at the OAS. He is the number one employee of the, the, employee of the month because he's always looking to please the, their masters. But well, let's listen to another question. I leave that concern there because there is another question from General Bill Hamill, who is a Mexican card journalist. By the way, he's the president of the Republic Broadcasting System of the Mexican state. Vice President, here in Mexico we value and support all popular consultations and mechanisms of direct democracy to support decisions as important as the cancellation of an airport project. In the case of Mexico or in the case of Venezuela, this dispute with Guyana, which well, has gained Latin American and international relevance. My question is, from your point of view, how will the consultation to be held next December 3 reinforce Venezuela's position in favor of maintaining the mediation of the United Nations in this conflict where there are evidently the interests of powerful transnational companies in the oil sector. I would also like you to tell us what can the Mexican state do to reinforce the sovereignty and dignity of Venezuela in this case? Thank you, Genaro. This also brings us to a question that Ana Teresa had made and we didn't answer about the constitutional basis for consultation. Well, our consultation is very clear. Sovereignty resides in the people, and the people also have the right. This is found in Article 71 of our Constitution. The people have the right to participate in a consultative referendum to address essential issues of national life. And here we are talking about the territorial integrity of Venezuela. We are not talking about talking about just anything, it is the territorial integrity that is being consulted to the Venezuelan people. What results from this consultation will be a mandate for the Venezuelan state. What results from this consultation will be a mandate for the Bolivarian National Armed Forces, it will be a mandate for all the institutions of the Venezuelan state. Even if it is not binding? It is a referendum to consult the Venezuelan people to see what the Venezuelan people think about these five questions. And then when Genero says, ask what Mexico can do, we have to add voices to defend our Latin America and the Caribbean as a territory of peace, because there is really a threat from powerful transnationals.
poderosas transnacionales from the government of the United States, from Guyana, who is threatening. It is not Venezuela who is threatening. There is a lot of money behind Guyana's campaign claiming to be innocent victims, but their friends are the ones threatening other nations in the world. They are not the victims of the world. Their friends are not the people being massacrated, and I am referring to both of them. I'm referring to the Exxon Mobil, which pays them, and which pays for the defense before the International Court of Justice. I am referring to the Pentagon and the Southern Command, which carries military exercises against Venezuela together with Guyana. It is an imperialist position. It replicates those colonialist methods against Venezuela, threatening this region. So the call is for our region, the countries of our region, to raise their voices and ask for a negotiated solution. It is, a very, it is very serious that Guyana says it is not going to talk. It is very serious that Guyana says that it's not going to negotiate. What is Guyana thinking? What is Guyana thinking? When they know very well that the International Court of Justice, the unilateral claim they presented is contrary to Venezuela in the legal way that denies the expressions of Venezuela's will. They went without having Venezuela's consent, and they should have had Venezuela's consent because that is what's stated in the Geneva's agreement. Vice President, excuse me, negotiating applies to condominium, for example? They are proposals. They are proposals. What scenarios? These are proposals that were even presented at the time of the negotiations with Guyana, but the question behind us, this is, who benefits from the exploitation of these natural resources? When you analyze the data in Guyana, they begin to have revenues from oil production and exploitation from 2019, 2019, 2020, 2021, 20, 2022, 2023. The social impact that these revenues have had has been zero in the social indicators of Guyana. This was shown in the equality indicators, in human development indicators. They are the same as in 2015, and especially in the provinces in the hinterland of Guyana, extreme poverty is rampant. There you realize, and we have shown it, that Guyana's oil tax regime is to benefit the big transnationals. Two-thirds of the revenues go to the big transnationals. There, were, there, when you compare that the oil tax regime of Guyana and Venezuela, Venezuela's oil tax regime is much more noble for our people in terms of benefits than what Guyana has. A concrete example, royalties paid to Guyana, 1 or 2 percent, royalties to Venezuela, 30 percent. There is a real dif clear difference. Then, for whom is Guyana exploding? Why is Guyana going to a confrontation threatening Venezuela with the United States. Is it for its people? No. And when you talk about condominium, I was telling you that there are proposals that have come up at different moments of the negotiation, but Guyana has already been very clear about its objective. Guyana was very clear on its objective to benefit the big transnationals and not the development of the people or Guyana or Venezuela or the Caribbean people. There's a very interesting fact, Vice President, and it is that when Venezuela want went through nationalization in 2005, and the companies that were here began to move to joint ventures. The only one of the few that did not change is ExxonMobil. In 2006, Rick Tylerson was the CEO for the Obama administration. He was still the CEO of the ExxonMobil until 2016, and then he became Secretary of State. So that is what the puzzle is which is very obvious. It is already the policy of greater aggression during the Trump administration and Taylorson as his Secretary of State. It is what this controversy is further fueled, and when Guyana assumes very radical positions of turning its back on international legality, not only violating the Geneva Agreement, but also violating international law by offering territories in a sea that has not been delimited. And let's leave Mexico right now, Vice President. Now we are going to Dominican Republic with Juan Carlos Espinal from Red Social TV. Later on, we will elaborate a bit on what you were saying. Who will benefit from this oil exploitation? Will this also benefit the people of the Caribbean? But let's listen to Juan Carlos first. 
How to understand, how to realize that on the one hand, the State Department of the United States of the government of Joe Biden, who is insisting on re-election, is using the government of Guyana to dispute territories that have been sufficiently discussed in terms of international public law. On the other hand, the Barbados agreements of the discussions and debates of the dialogues carried out by the government of President Nicolás Maduro in Barbados have been agreed with the Venezuelan opposition for the presidential elections, and then these referendums arise. How can we from Latin America and the Caribbean understand the geopolitical ambiguities of these corridors and at the same time, on the other hand, stimulate the internal dialogue in Venezuela? Well, in addition to the matrix, we, in Venezuela we hear that the issue of the Guyana Esequiba is in electoral juncture. I think that's where it's heading to. No, it has nothing to do with it, because remember that this situation worsened in the month of September when Guyana announced that it was granting concessions in a sea pending delimitation. Very serious, very serious. What does that mean, Vice President? After the final land boundary, it is possible to start a negotiation process on the sea. What has happened here? The territorial sea. The maritime, the maritime territory. What has happened here? First, Guyana is even prejudging the results of the International Court of Justice because by taking possession of that sea pending delimitation, they are taking for granted what will be the result of the process being carried out in the International Court of Justice as a result of their unilateral claim. They have already reached a decision, and therefore they have gone to the sea. But it also not only prejudges, it violates international law and international maritime law, because this should be submitted to a process of consensus and negotiation. They are handing over the sea. What they lack is to rule over the airspace. I have said it because they are going even further, and that is why that was recently in September. President Nicolás Maduro, in view of this situation, in view of this process, where they are going to the International Court of Justice without having the voluntary consent of Venezuela, giving that process is being made in the granting of concessions in a sea pending to be delimited. Well, the situation arises where the Venezuelan parliament, the National Assembly, addresses this and decides to summon the Venezuelan people. They decide to consult the Venezuelan people. And with the United States making statements in support of Guyana, in some way, they are impacting Barbados agreement because there is a very clear position in the Barbados agreement. Answering a little bit the question, answering a little bit the question of this fellow journalist from the Dominican Republic, Juan Carlos. In some way, it is also adding fuel to the fire, which is stoking a situation in which Guyana is very clear in the script. It is very clear. Guyana is not heeding the calls that have been made for dialogue. Guyana is not heeding the fact that they are bound by the Geneva Agreement. They are still part of an agreement that is in force. That agreement cannot be terminated by any of the parts. That agreement ends the day there is a practical and satisfactory solution for both parties. And then what did Guyana pretend in the International Court of Justice? Venezuela has said that there was a triumph. We do not consider it a triumph, but that the court reviews the actions of the United States kingdom since 1835, or the Paris Arbitral Award for Venezuela is something positive. Yes, in November 2022, when Venezuela went with the figure of pre preliminary sanctions, Luis Guillermo, making it very clear that he does not recognize the compulsory jurisdiction over this dispute, but he was asking very basic questions. Who signed the Treaty of Washington of 1897? Guyana did not even exist as a republic. Guyana was a colony. 
when the fraudulent sentence of the Paris Arbitral Award of 1899 was issued. Guyana did not exist as a republic, it was a colony. And Venezuela was saying that here an essential third party is missing, which is the United Kingdom, an essential third party. We always made our position very clear, but we wanted to somehow uncover what was happening. And there, well, the court does not admit the preliminary sanction, but says that in the end it will study the United Kingdom sanctions. It also says other things in that decision of the year 2020, of December 2020. The court says to Guyana, I am not going to review here the maritime territory. That is why it is very serious what Guyana is doing, deciding over a sea that is not delimited and where it was also excluded in the claim that they had in their unilateral plan. Now, you mentioned in your last media presentation, well, that the royalties from oil exploitation do not reach the Guyanese people, as you just explained. Well, there is a concern about the, this issue among other colleagues that, for example, Barbados, which is a country that is a friend of ours, we are going to listen to David, our colleague David. David Denny. Go ahead, David. My name is David Denny, and I'm the General Secretary for the Caribbean Movement for Peace and Integration, and also the General Secretary for the Friends of Venezuela Solidarity Committee in Barbados. We are very supportive of your government's position to hold a referendum in relation to the issue between Guyana and Venezuela. So we are very supportive of that initiative. But my question to you would be to ask you if we can develop a situation that would allow us as Caribbean people to work together and to develop the type of industry and working relationship that both the Venezuelan people, the Guyanese people, and the wider Caribbean can benefit from the resources that are between Guyana and Venezuela? That's my question. That, that's a very good question because I do not know why there is an agreement with Trinidad and Tobago and there is the issue of the blockade imposed by the United States on the Caribbean countries. An immoral blockade because to impact the Caribbean as it has been done through the blockade of Venezuela, just look at what happened with Haiti. Haiti is practically a failed state and that was after what? After the brilliant idea they had of locating Venezuela, were the financial flows to finance and port social programs in Haiti simply dried up and, well, a very serious economic and social situation, a real humanitarian crisis in Haiti. David's question is very important, and it is the question that gets straight to the core of the issue. And I repeat, Guyana is openly openly working for the transnational corporation. Not for the Caribbean. Not for the Caribbean. I would like to see the president of the Guyana design a program similar to the Petro Caribe. That was what I was going to ask. I have already asked about it. If you remember, Madalena, the CELAC European Union Summit in Brussels, we pointed out in our intervention. I would like to see among those who are here who is willing to design a program like Petro Caribe that would benefit the peoples of our region be because we have the right to grow as a region, to develop our great potential as Latin American and the Caribbean. This is a region called to be a great power, but the position of Guyana that victimizes itself is not our resources are for the transnationals, not even for our own people. Look, there is a very important fact, Luis Guillermo. Look for the report presented by Guyana in 2015 in the World Trade Organization. 
There, Guyana knocks down all these arguments that Venezuela impedes its right to development, that Venezuela is imperialist, that because in Venezuela already has resources that it wants to take away from them, a barbarity that they have expressed. But in that report, they state the positive impact that Petro Caribe had in Guyana. Because let us remember that Guyana also benefited from Pedro Garibe in a very important and suitable integral policy of Commander Chavez to add cooperation for development. But Chavez was very firm in the defense of this controversy of our right over the Guyana Esequiba, and Chavez was very firm in saying that in the Geneva Agreement, but at the same time he added this program. In the report of the World Trade Organization, those numbers are stated. The positive impact of Petro Caribe had on the economic and social development of Guyana. The question that David has asked is the main question. Why is Guyana refusing to negotiate? Why is Guyana refusing to reach a consensual agreement with Venezuela? An agreement that, as you have just said, for example, just now the exploitation of the dragon gas Field was signed with Trinidad and Tobago, a brother country, a neighbor country. Why in this case we cannot reach a similar agreement that have a positive impact on the Caribbean? And on the contrary, they go to imperial France. They are going to benefit the big transnationals and other people. The social data of Guyana is hidden. They do not publish it because they, do, they know we have seen through the data, figures from the United Nations organizations on human development and equality, and they have hidden it. We will have to check the account of Irfan Ali, the president of Guyana, to see how he's going to do. And from Barbados, vice president, we are now going to another Caribbean country that is very concerned about the development of the situation, and this is related to another colleague who is in Belize. Let's listen to her. If there is an affirmative vote in the referendum approving the integration of the current population in the Essequibo region, and they are to be automatically considered Venezuelans, how soon will that process begin after the vote? Interesting the questions from the colleagues, isn't it? Yes, very good. This refers to the fifth question of the creation of the Guyana Essequibo territory so that we can give attention to our population because it is our population and we are going to see that this population can have complete attention. So those who want to have their identity card have the right to have their identity card and access to any, programs. Is there any idea about how many Guyanese would like to be Venezuelan? Not exactly, Luis Guillermo, not exactly. But we know that poverty is widespread and, well, it is an area that requires integral attention. What is vision? Vice President, we're practically in the final stage of the program, but here in the production team, we wanted to play a little bit seriously. We know that you play ping pong. It had to be one of Luis Guillermo. But you have seen her playing. She's very good. How long has it been since you last played ping pong? In China. I played in China. Recently? Recently, when we were in China. I told you not to come up with this one of yours. They didn't set the table, so we are going to have to ask questions that look like ping pong. We are going to do ping pong, we are going to put some words, and you with your intellectual rocket are going to give an answer. Is that okay? I'm going to start with one. Plunder. Luis Almagro. This small. Irfan Hali. Exxon Mobile employee. International Court of Justice. We ratify our historical position. Esequibo. Territory of Venezuela. I leave you because you are insisting on saying it. So, the question. I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm one of those who think that our A star, I'm Venezuelan, our A star of, on the Venezuelan flag is the province of Guyana, as Bolivar declared it, which include the territory of Esequibo at the time. Then the question is... Uh, and in the 1819 Constitution of Angostura incorporates the province of Guyana. Exactly, because of the 17th Bolivar declares it. And one year before, they start. <laughs> Our Guyana Esequiba said it. Now, the arbitral Paris award, a fraud. Geneva Agreement. The special law for the sides. I add... 
Last consultative referendum, mandate of the Venezuelan people. Well, Vice President, thank you very much for being here with us time and time again. It must be said the Venezuelan government has called for dialogue. And on the ping pong table is the proposal of President Nicolas Maduro for a meeting with the Guyanese counterpart Irfan Ali in any Caribbean country to resume the Geneva Agreement and the Caribbean and Latin America is a region of peace and dialogue, and that is the best weapon. This has always been said, and when the electoral campaign began, what we heard from the people was that we are a country of peace. We are not a country of war. We do not like war, and we are going to the consultative referendum, which is our best weapon. Nor will we fall into provocations. Our out is peace. It has always been the way, and our Bolivarian diplomacy is well, one of peace. I still wanted to to do what? To continue with the program because above all up to here this program which which have called generally speaks. Of course this is a redundancy for journalists who ask questions, but well, generally speak. So thank you very much. Thank to you and for your time. Thank you. And you for following us, of course, on Telesur, which has inaugurated this series of programs with the vice president of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, and with such an important topic, do not hesitate that we will have a program of great magnitude with a significant person, such as the Vice President. Thank you for joining us.